Welcome to episode 24 of the Rollo and Slappy Show. I am Rollo McFlugel, and with me is Slappy Jones 2, and we are both at McFlugel.com. This episode will be for January 30th, 2017. The show notes page for this episode is McFlugel.com slash 24, where you will find links to subscribe to the podcast and other ways to connect with us, as well as a link to send Bill Crystal on an Iraqi vacation so he can see all the handiwork that his proposals in support of all his wars has done, so he can get a first-hand look of all that. And any proceeds that we get for that will be donated to Antiwar.com. Also, as we started doing last week, ever since Donald Trump was elected president and is now serving, we're keeping account of all of the minority groups that he has killed in the United States while in office. And last week that number was zero. We would we expected that number would greatly rise up again, and it's still zero this week. So maybe next week it'll be up in that uh, few hundred thousands to a million range that we you know all expected. So we'll see. So with that, I'll pass it over to Slappy, and he will introduce our guest for today. Well, thank you, Rallo. Today we have a special guest with us coming from the UK. Her name is Emily Pont. She writes for We Are Change, an activist post, and she also is actively supporting the release of Ross Ulbricht, who we've talked about on this show and several times on our blog. She works to expose corruption and raise awareness for important issues that are falsified by our lovely mainstream media and also for our rights to free speech and against political correctness. She likes to get into philosophical discussion regarding theoretical science topics. And uh, thanks for joining us, Emily. Yeah, thanks for having me on. And Rallo. A few weeks ago, Julia Churiansky of Brave the World, who, by the way, produces a lot of great content, so if you don't already follow her, I highly recommend it. But she made a post on Facebook with uh, talking about it's kind of delusions that we have about being happy and, and what goes on in the world. And we wanted to bring Emily on to kind of talk these ideas through. So I'm going to read this post right now. and We'll link to it on the show notes page as well for you to, to go and read it yourself too. Being nice to everyone is not a virtue. It makes you a lying fool. Loving everyone is not a virtue. It reduces the very meaning of love to nothing. Being happy all the time is not a virtue. It's delusion. Being positive all the time is not a virtue. It's as bad as being negative all the time. There isn't always a silver lining. Things happen for no reason at all, just as often as they happen for a reason, and it's too hard to discern. It's always meant to be, so saying so means nothing. And finally, try looking inwards and taking responsibility before you look on the bright side. So it's there's, there's a lot there. <laughs> and um, maybe with that in the context... You can interpret it in a lot of different ways, which is probably a good thing. So we're not trying to necessarily say what uh, Julia Churiansky of Brave the World meant, because um, yeah, that's for her to for her to say. So we're just using it as a jumping off point for uh, for our own ideas. So if you want to ha- ask her what she th- thinks about this stuff, yeah. So when we, we were having our discussion, um, I kind of disagreed with a lot of that because I think. I prefer to be happy. Uh, it doesn't mean I need to lie to myself to be happy. Of course, I have plenty of times on unhappy or angry or mad or sad or whatever. But I think it is a good thing to strive to be happy, but it wouldn't be a good thing to lie to yourself or to others. Um, and I certainly agree that when something goes wrong, you should definitely look inward and see how you messed up. But then... After I do that, I think of a way how I can make it better or how next time that won't happen. And in my head, I see that as kind of putting a silver lining on it. Like, you know, I just lost a sale or I just lost one of my customers at work. Look back at what I did. Okay, I did this or I did that or I forgot to send them this. That that sucks. I lost my client. So how am I going to learn from this mistake and going forward, not make it. And so, um, like, like Rallo said, we did, I didn't have context when I read that. Um, and so I don't know what her meaning was there, what she was trying to get at, but I don't, depending on how you spin it, I don't necessarily agree with all that. And I just want to know what your thoughts are, Emily, on, um, on that Facebook post. 
Well, one of the points you said was that uh, everything happens for a reason. And I thought, I thought that kind of, especially in negative situations, trying to kind of justify it with everything happens for a reason is kind of a, it's a cop out way of kind of putting that blame on to something that you can't really define or something that's kind of completely out of your control to kind of just shift off any sort of responsibility. So I agree that you should definitely look inwards when you make mistakes, because that's the only way you're really going to grow as a person rather than trying to kind of put it down to something that you can't define as an easy way to um, kind of get out of responsibility. Um, when she said about being nice to everyone and that it's, it's not a virtue, it makes you lying full, uh, I do agree with that, especially with, well, to an extent, I think you should, you know, you should be kind to people when you can, but you shouldn't kind of accept everything and tolerate everything that people do if you really don't think it's acceptable, that sort of thing. So, but I do agree with quite a lot of it. And what you said about being happy, I definitely agree with that. You should strive to be happy, but you shouldn't lie to yourself or that sort of thing. So that's my general stance on those sort of things. Yeah, I agree. As far as the, you know, it's all, oh, it's always meant to be. That's kind of one of those thought terminating cliches. That yeah, you, yeah you just toss it is. Up there and say, well, that's the way it goes. Or, you know, you win some, you lose some. And it just, it, it doesn't give you much of a jumping off point to, to do any sort of improvement. And maybe people just say that as a way to just end the moment, you know, put it into per perspective. And I certainly <laughs> use those sayings sometimes. Um, you know, it's, we're not, we're not trying to be robots and, and never have a uh, room to, to, you know, just yeah. say stuff. But um, yeah, as far as being nice to people, um, it's, yeah, I think it's a good thing to strive to to treat everyone well and be nice and kind and and you know turn the other cheek. But there are some just nasty people out there who will take advantage of you. And I think that if you, because I used to think, uh, oh, I'm I'm I get along with everyone, and uh, you know I have no reason to ever ever not get along with anyone. And you know, if I'm just nice to them, they'll they'll be nice to me. And I learned. <laughs> I learned that's not always true and it's not every it's it's a it's a small number of people at least in my experience but I think if you kind of have that delusion or being nice to everyone if you think that being nice to everyone is a virtue um or I, maybe virtue is not maybe the word virtue is uh is the word because I, I do think you should you should strive to be kind to everyone and but um I think you do have to react a little bit with how they treat you and not just because if you're just kind of I'm going to be nice to this person no matter what there's people that are going to take advantage of that and so it's kind of a, a delusion type thing well does being nice mean being naive or stupid because I can be nice to someone and not trust that person and not even like that person right so I guess Emily do you have any ideas on the basic ethical idea of um, how to treat other people. The, the I mean, if, if someone, not, let's, let's it, say someone is a total jerk and not a good guy and doesn't do good things. Is it wrong or are you lying to treat that person with respect? You know, generally walking past, you know. Yeah, I don't, I don't think you should have sort of a moral obligation to treat someone nicely who's being, you know, a really horrible person or doing something that you just don't think is acceptable. Um, you should, you know, you should be kind to people in general, but to, for their personal growth and for your own, you should, you know, call them out on what they're doing. You shouldn't just tolerate everything because that's just, as you said, it's just going to let people take advantage of you and it's not going to help them in the long run. They need, you know, if you think they should know something, if, they, if they're doing something wrong and you think they should know that, then I think it's more of a, you should feel more of a moral, moral obligation to call them out on it and talk about it rather than let things slide like that. Yep. And it's, and one thing that it's, it's kind of funny we're talking about this because we're talking and or at least I'm talking about, you know, the very rare cases where, um, there are someone that's, that you just isn't a good person you're talking to. Whereas I think a lot of mainstream, mainstream society allows for, if you just don't like someone, what someone stands for even a little bit, whether or not you met them, you can just go out in the street and get a group of people and just scream horrible things about them and you know as we see now punching them in the face um 
So we're not, it's, it's funny because we're, we're, we're getting in the weeds on this one and it's good and it's great. And I think we should. Um, but I think someone on the outside might be listening to this and being like, oh, this is kind of obvious stuff, but then they turn around and go on a march and just treat people with whom they just have disagreements on political philosophy yeah, and just treat them like absolute garbage. So it's, well, I think the problem with how we're treating each other is, is it is a problem. And I think when you get wrapped up in allowing other, other ideas to kind of pervade through instead of looking at them as a person. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. There's always sort of people just acting so horribly to each other and it I'm only over, you know, politics. And if it's not something personal, but you know, if it's not a personal issue, I just, I can't see how people are getting so angry over it. It's <laughs> it's sad how people are just have so, so full of hate for other people simply because of their ideology. Right. It's like, um, you know, if if I met Hillary Clinton, I, she's one of those bad people that I would, I think, is <laughs> more evil people in the yeah. world. I I wouldn't, you know, walk. Oh, hi, Miss Clinton. Let yeah. me shake your hand. I would, you know, ignore her and turn the other way. Well, I have absolutely nothing to do with her. Um, so that's how I would deal with a person who I think is a horrible, evil person. Yeah. Whereas people who oh, mainstream, it's, you know, oh, you get to get a group of people and scream at them at a protester. I was even, it was funny. Um, I was at a, a baseball game standing over the bullpen and there's a woman heckling and screaming at the, the catcher and, uh, when he was done warming the pitcher up, she was asking for him to toss the ball up to give to her son, and he just he he faked through it at her and laughed at her, and she got all offended. But like, what are you, you're being a horrible person to him for the last forty five minutes, you know? And it's that's something simple. It's just he's wearing a different color shirt, and so you know you're acting like he's the worst person in the world. It's uh, it's kind of funny because I think if if someone saw me interact with Hillary Clinton, the way I just described, I, I think pe uh, most people would think, Oh, you're at, you're actually being a jerk there because you know, you just, you disagree with her politics. But, uh, it's kind of funny that when it's the, p the people who are involved in the direct involvement and in killing others and, you know, doing all sorts of horrible things, you gotta be really, really nice to them. But when there's just uh -huh. Joe Schmo on the street, it says, actually, I want to vote for so-and-so it's, they're the most horrible, evil person in the world, and you get to say whatever you want. I was going to say, if you were angry at everyone who disagreed with you politically, you'd be a very angry person all the time, pretty much. <laughs> so maybe that's where we can we can start taking this. Is you know, I don't I don't know exactly what all of your uh, political philosophies are, Emily. So maybe that's a good thing. So we can kind of talk and um, well, but well, how do you? I said, you know, how I would deal with Hillary Clinton, you know, and, and she's someone who would have a direct involvement in wars. And so she's directly responsible. What about the people that would, you know, vote for her? And uh, they say that, you know what, I do think it's okay to go out and, you know, kill or, you know, you're talking about Ross Ulbricht earlier. Someone who says, yeah, uh, he committed a crime. We should, you know, fry him, you know, do it's whatever we got to do. Right. So what, what do we... How do we interact with them? Someone who isn't directly responsible for espousing or for um, committing these bad acts that the, the state normally does, but, you know, absolutely supports it. And because I've had someone one time said, yeah, we should we should go and kill all the kids in the Middle East because they're the next terrorists. I was like, what? I, you know, I decided at that point I didn't want to have anything to do with them. You know, is that do we chalk that up to just being ignorance and or do we say or we take that more seriously and, and really say hey we want to that's a good reason to dissociate from someone I think I think it's a bit of both I think mostly it's about ignorance people most people who support the state and what sort of uh, very strongly support a kind of really strong government control uh, they're ignorant to actually things that they've done and the harm they're causing to humanity I'm quite as strong I say in my libertarian beliefs so anything that kind of really harms other people for no you know no good reason especially Ross you know it's uh 
I'm very against that. But I think people who very strongly support the state are ignorant to a lot of things that a lot of harm they're doing. And I think it's good to try and educate them, but people, it's a lot of ignorance and arrogance as well with some people, because I've had I've had interactions with people who are you know trying to inform about issues that the government uh, you know there's really bad things the government are doing and they just don't want to hear it because it's it kind of breaks their paradigm of like kind of a it breaks the paradigm of liking that control and not seeing anything wrong with it. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and to that, I I you know, I agree that there's there's ignorance and I used to be a you know rah-rah Republican and supporting wars and, and taxes and everything. It's because I was, I didn't, I don't want to dismiss it as, oh, I just didn't know any better, but I, you know, that's what I grew up she with. And I, that's what, yeah, that's what basically everyone in the world grows up with. So. Which brings me, Emily and I were talking off the air earlier, which I thought this was really interesting, Emily, over in the UK. I imagine you didn't learn about libertarianism in school. <laughs> so since we have you on would you mind telling that story again of yeah. how, how you became a libertarian how you found this um i think that's so impressive it's hard enough in the united states where we apparently have this whole freedom thing uh, ingrained in us uh, but uh us over here we think all you over there are socialists so how did you find libertarianism uh, it was through the free. It was through um, the Silk Road case. I was kind of following it. I just found out about it just maybe over a year and a half ago, and the sentence that Ross got was just absolutely insane. For he's a non-violent, you know, non-violent person with no criminal record. No, you know, he seemed like a a really decent guy, and it just seemed insane that he got double life for essentially creating a website. And um, so I looked kind of further into his philosophy and found libertarianism through that and really resonate, that really resonated with me. And um, the more I kind of found out about the corruption of the Silk Road, the more I kind of hmm. really kind of got into libertarianism and started exploring that. And um, just going through kind of the chat logs on the Silk Road site, it's such a, it's such a beautiful like libertarian philosophy that um, DPR was kind of putting out there. And it just kind of made me see Ide ideologically in like a very different light to what I've been exposed to over here, which was just mostly socialism and that sort of thing, because that's kind of that is very predominant over here. So that's kind of how I got into libertarianism. And um, it just kind of grew and grew as I kind of learned more about Ross's case and people related to that and the community that was just there. It was, yeah. So was Ross's, was the case big over there? Um, Mm, I hadn't heard about it. I had to look. I, um, I just came across it online. Okay. And so, no, no, it wasn't. It wasn't really big. Yeah, that's that's pretty amazing. <laughs> you came, it really you is. Came yeah. to it that way, and it goes to show that, um, and it even ties back into what we we're originally talking about. That um, maybe just tangentially, but there, there's good as as horrible as this whole, the, the Ross Ulbricht cases and, and how tragic and, and it just, it burns me up that any of it happened, that there's good coming out of it. Um, and oh, there's, there's your silver lining, right? Yeah. Um, and the way, and I think it has a lot to do with the way the family's handling it and the way the kind of person Ross is. But Lynn Albrecht is an absolutely amazing woman. And what she's done, you know, most people, it would be absolutely no one, no one would bat an eye if your son gets taken away from you for life, and you just say, uh, you just kind of bottle yourself up and and go away in a corner. Uh, but she's like done nothing but work and spread the message, and has you know touched a lot of lives and acts as a role model. You know, I look at, at Lynn Albrecht and you know really, really, truly look up to her. Yeah. And so. You know, Ross Ulbricht and his family has had a, a huge positive, positive impact on me and thousands and thousands of other people too. So, um, it it it's nice that there's an example. Well, in the in, to read the exact quote from the text, there isn't always a silver lining. Well, this might be one of those. Uh, you know, not always things, and that doesn't mean that we're not going to. Yeah, uh, it doesn't do change the fact that Ross right. is still in prison. Right. You know, we don't, and that's, that's maybe where people get led astray is that they see, find something good 
in a bad situation, they say, oh, well, oh, there, there's the good. That's, that's good enough. But, um, yeah. yeah. So, so on that, Emily, what are you doing in the UK? If anything, I mean, I, I can't imagine there's a big libertarian community there. Do you have any local groups or websites you write for in the UK? Is there, is there anything you can do talking to friends or it's, it's very hard to kind of find anyone who's interested in libertarianism and that sort of thing here. But um, I hosted an event a couple of weeks ago to try and kind of raise awareness about the Silk Road case. So I um, put on a deep web documentary and had a Skype in with Lynn just to kind That's of show, yeah, just to kind of get more awareness for the case and get those more get those philosophies out there more. But um, as it as it stands, no one's really. Nothing's really in the UK. It's a lot more like I do writing for kind of We Are Change and Active Choice, mm -hmm. which is in America, because it's just much more prominent with the um, those sort of philosophies over there. But uh, yeah, there's not much. That would, no, there's no kind of group, libertarian groups, or that sort of thing over here that I know of anyway. Well, you never know. I mean, Slappy and I, when we first started um, talking about libertarianism and, and doing the, the website, we're like, I, there's got to be. There's, I don't know if there's any, because we're from around the Philadelphia area, and we're, like, we're looking for, maybe we should start a group and, and try to find and cultivate other libertarians, and then lo and behold, there's a huge <laughs> network that we had no idea, you know, we're looking for, it, but it was right on, under our noses, so you never know, hopefully, um, hopefully you start finding like-minded people, and then also, it sounds like you are cultivating, so that's that's awesome, and it does work, Yeah. Um, we've, because we've done it um, with ourselves, mostly with friends, and um, make sure we have like this little monthly meetup group where we sit down and talk about, you know, whatever we want to talk about. And it's, you know, you're supposed to go in and, you know, hear everybody out. And it ends up always being, uh, we don't need the state, is what, is what, is what yeah. Slappy and I bring. And, and people have, you know, when you, the average person, if you were to bring that up to them, they'd say, you're crazy, that's stupid. But when you sit them down and, and first you have, you give them a topic that they're talking about and you sit there and listen to them and show them respect. And then when it's time to talk about your idea, which normally would be absolutely crazy to them, then they're a lot more likely to be willing to sit down and listen to you and actually talk to you as a person and discussing the ideas. Um, we've, we've, it's act, I'm actually amazed with how people have changed over uh, the course of, I guess it's been like a year and a half we've been doing it. But that's awesome. How was your, uh, how, what kind of turnout did you get for the, the show? Um, quite good. About maybe 60 people 60 oh wow that's fantastic yeah. that's awesome yeah that's awesome yeah it was really good i was i was very happy with it and um a couple of people from that it was really good because as you said about um kind of listening to people and getting them to see your your um way of mind about two people who um came to the event really strongly supported the uh, case after that and became kind of libertarians <laughs> libertarians that's that's Really it's, cool. That's a great yeah. story. Yeah, that's that's the way we've um, we found that uh, to talking to people that aren't yeah. libertarian, how to get them in is you, you got to find that you know excuse this term, but trigger point for them. Yeah. <laughs> Where they, um, you know, everyone has something about the government that they don't like, and probably that they absolutely hate and despise and loathe. So as you know, libertarians, we don't like anything the government does. So you can you can always find something you can agree with someone on about the problems of the state and then you just you know you, you slowly expand off that and you know there's a there's potential in, in just about everyone yeah so um i don't know do we have any final thoughts on on what we're talking about it's uh yeah i mean i just want to thank emily for joining and Hopefully, we could have her on again. We could talk about Ross Albrecht or anything else. You know, this, the um, the PC culture in the world and and how that compares here toward over there, and what we can do about it. And is it as dangerous as we say it is, or is it as righteous as they say it is? I think there's some good topics we could have in the future if you'd ever want to come back on again. Yeah, I'd love to. That'd be great. Uh, right. So Emily, can you tell us where people can find you? Um, um, 
any articles I write on um, We Are Change Directors post, so you can find me there and on Twitter at, um, at M2612. Okay. Yeah, we'll, uh, so we'll link that in the show notes page. And um, Slappy or Emily, well, what we do after every episode is talk about a market success story. So I know we're putting you on the spot, and if you want to defer, that's <laughs> fine um, because I, I'm having trouble thinking of one this morning. But uh, Slappy, Unless you have something, Emily, go for it. But otherwise, Slappy. Uh, uh, yeah, Slappy. <laughs> 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 All right. Well, let's see. So um, what could I have for the market this week? I'm unprepared. Uh, we're recording this at 4.30 in the morning, Eastern time, on a Sunday morning. So my mind isn't all here. Um, well, if but <sighs> I have the obvious one right now. So okay. we mentioned that, you know, we mentioned that Lappy and I are in the Philadelphia area and Emily's in the UK and we're having a conversation live right now. Now you'll hear the recording of it, which is good because my internet <laughs> cracked, you know, yeah, stopped in the middle of it. Editing. Yeah, there'll also be some editing magic. And, and that's another thing. So I, 20 years ago, five years ago, 10 years ago, five years ago, it would to be able to do this, there's three average people. Just to be able to one day agree, you know, we set it up first. We f were able to find each other, which is amazing, you know, different places around the world and say, hey, let's let's record ourselves talking and then put it up for other people. Um, you know, and, and outside of the cost of, you know, when we originally bought our computers and buying the Internet connection, we didn't have to pay for this. So it's, you know, 10 years ago it probably would have cost, you know, unbelievable amounts of money to try to set all this up. And before that, it's just no amount of money <laughs> would have been able to accomplish it. So it shows, really shows the power of the market. But even just think of how we became libertarian. I mean, Rallo and I would talk on the front porch about stuff, but we were still both Republicans. Who knows if we ever get, even get to this point without the Internet? Right, because I went online and saw you know, people talking about it anarchy and anarcho-capitalism and thinking that isn't that like throwing Molotov cocktails and stuff yeah yeah crushing windows and burning buildings down yep so uh, uh, what did I have no that's it I guess no right, right so, yeah show notes page is mcflugel.com slash 24 where you will find uh, links to the Facebook post that we we're talking about and um, also, we'll link to Emily's uh, Twitter account and activist post and uh, We Are Change, so you can check out all the stuff she's done. Also, you can subscribe to the podcast on iTunes and Stitcher there, as well as find us and like us on Facebook and follow Slappy and I on Twitter. So uh, with that, we thank very much for Emily for coming on. It was, yeah. a, it was a great talk. I hope to have you on again sometime soon. And Thanks for listening. Yeah, we'd love to. Thanks. Bye. Peace.